I'm very happy to see everyone here. Thank you for coming. So, on behalf of the Department of English and American Studies and the Shirley and Leslie Porter School of Cultural Studies, in partnership also with the new Center for the Study of the United States, partnered with the Fulbright Program, it gives me enormous pleasure, uh, especially today, to welcome you all to this very special event sponsored by the Yael Levine Writer in Residence Program on the very happy occasion of the publication of our dear colleague and friends, Dr. Sonia Wiener's book, American Migrant Fiction, Space Narrative Identity. Which, uh, came out this year with Brill. And it is quite rare, I'm sure you can realize, even for those among us, not me, uh, the work on living authors. For those of us who work as critics and scholars of literature and art in illuminating and elucidating the work, works of others have the opportunity to be in dialogue with some of the artists and the authors to whose work we dedicate our critical endeavors. But this is precisely what Sonia in her remarkable book, in the process of writing it and after, succeeds and succeeds, succeeded and succeeds in doing and thanks to the Yalavin Endowment, we were absolutely delighted to be able to host this year as the timing of the publication of Sonia's book celebrated cartoonist, comics, and graphic novel artist G.B. Trang, whose award-winning graphic novel, Vietnam America, is the focus of one of five chapters of Sonia's important and tiny monograph. In the book, Sonia offers a fascinating analysis of what she describes and brilliantly elucidates as a, quote, tentative poetics of migrant writing, as it relates, above all, to the complex interplay between narrative and poetic form and spatial sensitivity in the works of five different authors and artists who benefit, as Sonia puts it, from, quote, an excess of roots and propose new visions of American selfhood." Unquote. The analyses Sophia, Sonia offers are as diverse and multifaceted as the five U.S. migrant subjects of her inquiry. Sarajevo-born, Chicago-based journalist and novelist Alexander Heyman, his friend and fellow Sarajevan, Montreal-based photographer Vladimir Lozovich, Dominican author Juno Diaz, Russian-born Jewish-American novelist <laughs> Boris Fishman, whom you may recall also visited us two years ago as a elevated writer in residence, Indian Berkeley-based filmmaker and novelist Vikram Chandra, and our own elevated guest this year, G.B. Tran, a second-generation Vietnamese born in the U.S. one year after his refugee parents and siblings fled Saigon. Especially striking is the way in which space, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this in Sonia's conversation with GB, especially striking is the way in which space, both actual Euclidean space and various figurations of space as that which also exists in mediation between different locations, roots, places of identity, homes in plural, which we'll hear more about later. Features central in Sonia's analysis of each of her chapters to accrue unique and at times even startling meanings through a given author's or artist's work. This is, this is especially noticeable, as we'll soon hear more, in Sonia's reflections on G.B. Tran's graphic memoir, where the art form of the graphic novel, with its unique conflation of image texts and frames and the spaces between frames, creates in Sonia's words, quote, a fluid, alternative space, which allows for an ongoing process, in this case of healing a family fracture and reconstructing and reimagining a fragmented memory, both collective and personal. So in honor of this important publication, we have assembled here today a truly unique collection of speakers, of literary critics, scholars, and artists, who will each in their own unique way speak to the rich intersections of migration and representation in art, 
as the title of our symposium today indicates, Crossing Borders, Crossing Media. So I will speak each of our, I will introduce each of our speakers in turn as they come up. Uh, but first, first of all, our very own Dr. Sonia Wiener, a lecturer in the Department of English and American Studies, whose book we've gathered here today to celebrate is, of course, a combination, as it always is, of many years' work, partly funded by the Israel Science Foundation grant, and her specialization in contemporary American migrant literature and transnationalism, but also as it relates to her other work in related fields in African American literature, graphic novels, visual culture, I think I'll add jazz as well. <laughs> and Sonia, as I already said, will be speaking first about the multifaceted world of graphic narrative with our Elevine writer and resident, G.B. Tran, who is, as we already mentioned, an award-winning cartoonist, comic book, and graphic novel artist and writer, who apart from his prolific work as artist and graphic designer, also teaches the MFA in comics at Cal Arts. He's the author and artist of Vietnam America, which came out in 2011 and won numerous awards, including the gold medal in sequential art from the Society of Illustrators, and was ranked by Time Entertainment as one of the top 10 graphic memoirs of all time. His many other works include the truly lovely comic strip Fatherhood Survival Guide and many other comics, artful contributions across genres and media. Please, Sonia, GB, join us. Uh, thank you, Noam, for this uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here just to, to say that after teaching G.B. Tran's memoir, Vietnam America, several times here in Tel Aviv, and I see some of, of my students here, and he was also in my class earlier today when we had a chance to encounter some, uh, some other or some similar students. Um, so after teaching it with his novel, uh, his memoir, several times here in Tel Aviv, and after thinking with and about uh, the memoir in my book, I am really excited to have uh, G.B. here in person, and as I told him earlier, um, <laughs> it feels like a character has pretty much stepped out of the pages of a book uh, and uh, materialized here. Uh, so thank you, G.B., for joining us today. So as, as Noam said, and maybe I'll elaborate in just a little bit for those of you who haven't read his uh, memoir. Um, Vietnam America is the journey of G.B. Tran's discovery of his family's history, as well as their journey through a Vietnam colonized by French, Japanese, and Americans. And finally, it is the journey of G.B.'s parents, siblings, and grandmother to the United States just days before the fall of Saigon uh, in April 1975. And this, of course, initiated yet another journey, and that of turning an alien country into a home. So this, I believe, is an ongoing uh, uh, journey. A lot right? of journeys in one book. A lot of journeys in a lot one book. <laughs> so right, so as, uh, as Noam said, right, born a year after you know, your family arrived as refugees uh, in the US, uh, you're reconciling this complicated history of war and dislocation and migration um, by creating uh, a graphic uh, memoir, right? That's kind of this fragmented, <coughs> complex family history connecting across time and space. Uh, so my first question to you is, why the graphic form? Why? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Noam. Thank you to the endowment as well. Uh, thanks for you guys coming out, too. It's going to be evening out here. Uh, so why? Why comics? Why comics? Why not? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, but the, the real answer is because I, uh, growing up in South Carolina, I, I remember, clearly remember as a child wanting to read comics, my brother's comics. Um, and he wouldn't let me. So there's a, <laughs> out of curiosity, how many people read comics when they were younger? Okay, great. So he was the type of person who would buy the comics and then actually put them in the little plastic bag right away. Just like seal them because he thinks one day, like 30 years later, he'll be so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as a result, that's why he would never let me read his comics because he's just like, don't, don't damage my comics. But I would sneak them once in a while. And, and that's when I was my earliest memory of being introduced to this visual language. I and mean, granted, it was 
comics like X-Men and Transformers, so not exactly the most, um, I guess, literary interpretation of the medium, but still enough to, to galvanize the imagination, uh, this, this form of just like images and words and how entertaining they can be, uh, for sure. So. Okay, so just continue. We're gonna, yeah, and we're going to unpack this a little bit further as we go along, you'll see. Um, so the title of your work, as you can see here, Vietnam America, right, is the hybrid word, right? Something that is no longer Vietnam and yet not uh, quite America. Would you say that Vietnam Viet America is maybe a new, a new entity or a new kind of identity? Well, I would say it's not the first book named Vietnam America, so no. <laughs> That's true. There are if you go to Amazon and, and try to look for Vietnam America, yeah, you find it. But in your usage of it, you don't think it's uh, uh, for well, I mean, certainly for me, it's it's very important because that's that's why I went with it, despite finding out that there was another book name by it, which my my editor, my publisher, is like. I really encourage you to use a name that's more unique than something that's been published before. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so how many people know that that other book is? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, and I'm pretty sure they, the only reason why they know is because I told them, like, hey, I'm naming this, oh, yeah. this, even though this exists already. They're just like, hey, what? Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think it's, it's a perf it perfectly encapsulates the, the contents of the book, right? If you've read the book, uh, which, or studied the book, like yourself, uh, it is. It's it's it perfectly encapsulates this this journey for not only my character but all the characters, like my mother, and my father, um, and to me, it's also well, a certain degree. There's a little mystery to it, right? So that it's and that mystery is hopefully the, the mystery that I'm I'm able to elaborate when I do all the story right. in my family and stuff. Like yoking together what yeah. were previously two um, like not. Very friendly. Exactly. Exactly. And who necessarily is the Vietnam part? Who necessarily is the America part? That's not up for me to say, but it's actually for for you as a reader, mm -hmm. and the audience, to determine your own. Like, if you decide. Yeah. <laughs> it's time's up. We're over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Now I know which direction to click. Okay. So that kind of leads directly into the next. Um, ah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, this is when you peel away the dust jacket, you find hiding beneath the, the title uh, this intriguing face which is in the process of uh, being pieced together, which is much like you know, the title itself, but given to us kind of visually. Uh, so, so who is it um, and uh, why is it hiding underneath the dust jacket? Uh, it's hiding, it's, I mean, well, that question is hiding because uh, I think my publisher saw it and they're like, this is too complex of an image to make a cover. Um, which, you know, a little pulling the curtain aside to show a little bit of the cause of the commercial magic is they're just like, you know, we need a cover that's going to be very striking to someone to see so they can remember it and all those things. Like, okay, but I really do love this image and it was, that's why it's used on the hardcover. Uh, the puzzle pieces are actually um, the each piece is from a main character in the story. So there's pieces of my father and my mother, uh, my uncle, uh, my father's friend Doe, uh, the main characters in the stories essentially. Uh, and then just being puzzled together the, the, the face because exactly as you said, I mean this, this whole idea of like collecting memory that comes to you in various ways and forms and not in any type of order or organized way. And then just sitting back with all these memories and all these this history, and then like starting to try to like, as we talked about earlier, tether it all together somehow. And it doesn't necessarily result in a very harmonious image, right? But it does result in actually something that's, that is greater than the, the whole being greater than some of the parts. Hopefully. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's let's move on. Uh, this is actually the last page um, of the memoir, and it ends with a scene where you discover a book titled The Vietnam War. And the book is inscribed by your father to my son, Yeo Bao Tran, a man without history is a tree without roots. And I'm taking you back um, to a, a slide uh, from an earlier chapter where we learn that the book is a high school graduation gift from your father. So as a teenager, as you can see in this uh, page spread, you really by show... Look at my hair. Yeah, look at your hair. Yeah. <laughs> younger is longer, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, longer is younger. Um, 
So as a teenager, you, you can see you're really not showing any interest, and it kind of gets tossed into a, into a box and into storage. But when you find it several years later, unpacking these boxes in Brooklyn, uh, it sparks your interest. Uh, you can see you know, that you reach out immediately to the phone and ask your, your mom if you can join them on their next trip to Vietnam. So, uh, and that, of course, initiates the, the entire uh, journey that you begin on, on, you know, discovering your family. So, so what, ha what changed? What changed between, you know, your teenager, um, I mean, besides the fact that you were a teenager, you know, and then you were an adult, <laughs> yes. right? What, what, you know, what, how did that What changed to make me want to go back? Or to make you, you interested in your family you history. There are a couple of events, major events in my life that I, won't go into now because I will actually consume the rest of the time. But I'll go into on Thursday if anybody wants to come. Uh, but there were the combination of um, having my grandmother pass, which was relatively soon after this. Because the thing is that, so the, to fill in the blanks for that page where I'm reaching for the phone, for people in the story, this is the epilogue of the book. So it's the books, the story's done, and then there's a few pages that are blank to just pause, and then there's this three page or four page of the line, three page of the line. Um, and the first page of this, so this is page two, three, and the first page is actually me in a conversation with my mother talking about just, she's checking in with me, I just moved to New York, the big city, big scary city, she's just making sure I'm okay, and she's like, oh, we're going to Vietnam again, I was like, oh, I'm not really interested, I'm kind of busy, blah, 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 and all these things. So, so this is representing that like, immediate term, like you said, when I discovered the book, and it wasn't, I think, it, this was just the beginning. This wasn't suddenly like I opened the book and suddenly I realized, oh, I really, I want to spend the next five years of my life <laughs> doing <laughs> trivia like my family story. But it was just that it was the it was the nudge. It was the nudge that started the process, right? And that's why it's something in the book because for me, like, it had it's it's it has different significance here because of its location in the book because you, at this point you've read the book. Hopefully, as opposed to just skimming through it. Um, but you've read the book, so you've had you get the entire story, the entire story that this version of me has no idea that he's about to be exposed exactly. to, right? So this this was a nudge. This wasn't like me realizing, oh, I want to learn all about this about my family. This is a great opportunity for me to get back. But this was for me to, as a storyteller, to try to to connect with the audience a little bit more to show like that moment where, on hindsight, because hindsight is twenty twenty. It's like whoop, that was it. It's like, and but it, it's like you discover it at the moment where the reader has already ended the journey, but then suddenly it begins again. So you, yeah, you kind of cyclical. introduce this, this cyclical. Yeah, that is intentional. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, wow. let's wait through this for a minute because I wanted to ask you another question. Okay. Um, about the structure of Vietnam, which this, this slide that I went forward to is, is not, uh, not unconnected to it, but the structure is very intriguing, right? It's narrated basically in alternating chapters um, by you and, and your mother. Um, your mother's chapters move forward chronologically, mm -hmm. and she tells the history of, of the family, which uh, we're learning, it seems, together with you, the reader, right? Hearing yep. it through the mother. And then your chapters, or the chapters that you focalize, are very haphazardly arranged. So you know you jump, you begin later, and you go back in time. So, so uh, could you tell us a little bit about the rationale governing this structure, um, assuming that there is one? There is a rationale. Yes, there is a rationale. And um, well, first off, the structure—it's very, yes, it's very unconventional. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as I, it is the intention is it's supposed to mimic like our recollection of memory, right? When we learn about our family, we don't necessarily learn about our father, and then we learn about our grandfather, and then we learn about grand, our great grandfather, and like that. But it's just tidbits, bits and pieces that just come out of random things, whether it's family gatherings or me visiting my aunt in Toronto and learning about my father that way when he was a kid, and then going back to Vietnam and learning about my mother, and her brother, just all. Like the process of gathering the content, the, the core story from the America, and also all the extra material from the America, was very, very random. Um, and the challenge, and many times, I think, uh, default actually, the hardest part about the America wasn't necessarily finding the information, although that was pretty hard talking to my father. 
as he's a very tough guy. He's <laughs> yeah, and he raised a very tough son. So <laughs> tough on tough is not doesn't make for the best conversations. <laughs> um, so, but uh, but yes, that was tough. But the, the the more the most difficult part was actually how to connect them all, right? Right. To try to make a story because that was the um, when I sh I showed a, a writer friend an earlier draft of Viva America. And he, he gave me some feedback, and the most important feedback he gave me was that he's like, you've done a great job of basically recording and telling the story, like your family history here, but you've done a terrible job of actually telling a story. And I really deeply appreciated that feedback. It's just like, you need to actually start moving things so that you can actually find some type of story threads, some kind of <laughs> character arcs, which is, at the time, I was like, characters, these are my parents, they're not characters, but he's like, no, these are characters. And you have to create a story that they have arcs, and there's like, there's a progression in their lives and stuff like that. Um, and that's when I revisited like the structure of the story and how to move it around. And the underlying structure of the story is, it's, um, it's probably better done visually, actually. So I will use this. Um, this board or this board? It's easier for you guys. Either one. Okay. So, you're right that if you can imagine collecting memories, right? So you get this piece here, this piece there, just all random, right? And then when I sit down and actually try to figure out what's going to be, like, based off the feedback from my friend, it was like, what's, what's going to make a story? So the first thing I had to decide was, in the way I look at all my projects, whether they're very short or very long, is basically what makes sense to be the end of this story, the physical end of this piece, like the last scene that you're going to leave. So for me, in the book, which is, sorry for the spoiler for, not for you, Sonia. <laughs> but Sonia, what's the last scene in the book? That's put you on the spot. Uh, not the one that I showed? Not like the one right the before family that. Family leaving Vietnam. Right. So the family leaves Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I knew this was going to be the last scene of the story because it was the most important, it was the most visceral. It's the only chapter in the book that takes place of over just like 24 hours. Other chapters of the book take span days, weeks, years. So I knew this was going to be the absolutely the end of the book, no matter what came before it. So then, if we look at the book at this way, and yes, Sonia was absolutely correct. Where there's two themes, two plot threads, two characters that you follow. One from my mother's perspective, which is tells her, her um, my father's story growing up, and then the other one of my self discovery. So if you look at the book as chapters. There's 12 chapters total. So one is me, uh, and that's me as, for lack of better words, an adult. <laughs> uh, I think it's actually 2006, the second time I go back to Vietnam. So then the next chapter, chapter two, is in my parents, right? And they're, sorry, it's like, it's like, right? Uh, so my parents, and they're as, as when they were babies. And then chapter two goes back to me, as she was saying, that the structure undulates between me and my mom telling about the family history. And this chapter is set to 2001, which is my first trip back to Vietnam. And then three, and no one ever, this is something that I never tell anybody in such a situation like this. Like, I never told my editor, I didn't tell my wife, I didn't tell my writer friend, this is just, Something that I had to create so that I had a map, a road map, to figure out the story. So then my parents as uh, toddlers, approximately, growing up a little bit, more focused on my, um, oh sorry, this is three, this is four, right? So you're right, the structure for my parents is that it continues going until they get older and older and older. And the structure for me goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth is slowly getting younger and younger with a heavy dose of flashbacks. That's why it's a little bit more jumpy. But essentially, the, the core of the structure is basically these two threads moving so that my parents' timeline moves forward, my time moves backwards, they take switch back and forth, and they meet at the end, which is when family is from. <laughs> so that is, for me, like, no one, this is, this is what I needed to know so that I could stay sane while working on the book. And what, how confusing it is, how piecemeal it is uh, in the final version. I think I told you this anecdote. Like, I, I had my wife read it when I was, I was done with it. 
I don't, um, I don't have my wife read any of my things until it's done, because it's just, it, it keeps our marriage better that way. Um, I have, <laughs> so, well, it's because she has an emotional investment in it, right? Like, I can, I can take my writer friend telling me, like, you've done a terrible job of telling a story. I don't necessarily think I can take my wife telling me you've done a terrible job of telling a story. Um, that would not go over well. So I, and so I gave this, the book, a draft of this to my wife right before it was published, just so she knows what was going to be published. And she, her immediate feedback was like, I, I think your story is very confusing. Uh, you should have told it in a, a simpler, more straightforward fashion. I was like... <laughs> so, I mean, of course, uh, it's part of the, the, uh, the intrigue that the reader has to, has to puzzle these pieces together. Yeah, that's a thing, um, puzzling. Which is kind of right, yeah. puzzling, just like you need to puzzle the stories together. Um, and it's also interesting because you keep on, I mean, the reader gets similar events, but continuously from different directions. So, mm -hmm. so one event is never the same thing. It's, um, so well, let's now move to this kind of, I collected, yeah. uh, these are the, the way all of the chapters uh, that his mother narrates uh, begin, um, and uh, your mother is always in an intimate setting of the um, uh, kitchen, where mm -hmm. it looks to me like she's cooking Vietnamese yeah. food, yeah. Uh, and she's talking, one presumes, with you, so uh, maybe could you tell us something? Yeah, the, so the, what the... Uh, Frustratingly, maybe to the reader, my book is not, there are chapters, but they're not done in a traditional way. They don't start with a chapter, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Um, and there are no page numbers in the book either. Uh, so, well, there are a few. So, to denote when a chapter begins, actually, is are these little frames uh, of the book. And if, you're right, it's cooking, she's cooking, but that's because to my mother, that's how she expresses love, mm -hmm. is the cooking. It's not through hugs or kisses or saying like, good job, or so I'm is, proud of you, or anything like that. So this is like suggesting this an intimate moment between you and... It's extremely and intimate. This is her way of, you know, and I realized this probably after college, <laughs> that this was the way she expresses her love. And it's very evident now, too, like the way she um, interacts with my, my wife or her, her daughter-in-law. Who, who was as far away from she could have ever imagined her me marrying the person, um, but she teaches her recipes, and that's like that's how she's like showing and expressing her love. So this, so each, so each chapter about my mom about the bottom part of this timeline starts with this, and then on the other chapters with me, it'll just be an image of like an icon, an object, an airplane, or an airplane, a book, or you know, a photograph, or something like that. So also, um, uh, the, the graphics you use for representing your mother's voice, uh, it's in cursive writing. Um, so uh, we were wondering, as you we were reading it, whether you know, this represented some kind of an accent or a linguistic difference, or you know, maybe it was something that had to do more with her character. Because it's more difficult, you, know, you have to struggle really to read what she's saying, so I'm, I'm assuming this was... Well, the truth is, I didn't real. I never would imagine it was going to be that much of a struggle until the book was published, and one of the earliest feedbacks I got was from a librarian. Yeah. Oh no, it's actually a teacher, a teacher in high school, and she said, "I really love your book. I would love to have my students read it, but they don't know how to read cursive." <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, no one told me this." And then I did. I did some research, and I immediately found like this New York Times article saying like how cursive is slowly being removed from elementary or, or high school. I mean, I clearly remember learning cursive. Yeah. Um, so that was a little bit of a bummer. But it's it's but, no, it, it's just another yeah. you know uh, challenge and, and yeah. some, some interesting anecdote, especially you know if you compare it to other handwriting in the in the book, you know the father's bold. Yep. Yeah. Like, but to go back, yeah. So it is part of her character because just it's cursive. So uh, you know, as a, from a designer point of view, you're like typography, um, with fonts that have more curves and rounded parts to it are gen more general, or traditionally considered more like feminine, yeah. right? Um, so that was a perfect voice for her, and it was I think it was really important for her as a character to have um, a word balloons of fonts that was just exclusively her, mm -hmm. because she does do a lot of narration in chapters. Right. And then she's not, but she's not in the panel. She's like just off panel. Oh, or not even. So here we go. Oh, there we go. One oh, yeah. panel where I found your mother. Um, 
which uh, this this is for visiting her ancestral home, which is in the northern part of Vietnam. So basically, right, your mother had left there as a child uh, and relocated to, to the southern part of Vietnam when, when the communists took over. Um, and here you see her going back, and, and the page is really split down the middle, and there's uh, various kind of fractures in this page, um, and a lot of different time uh, situations uh, kind of uh, coming together. So can, can you, uh, and this, excuse the pun, walk us through this? Walk us through, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, right, this is when I went back to Lang Son in northern Vietnam. Uh, it was a, a trip for my mom to revisit her childhood home. So that's the four of us in that core group. So it's my mom, my father, myself, and my uncle. Her that brother. group appears various times on the, yeah. on the same page, right? Right, so in the background, I'm walking then, and then us in the mid-ground, and this in the foreground again. So there is this thing about like removing the temporal aspect of it, right? Because this time is, what is time? Time is like, okay, let's do this and do that. But, so that was immediately to set up this, try to, to, to prepare the reader for a different perception of time. Um, and then the right column then goes back in time because then you start with the image of my mother as she is then uh, older. And then each panel she goes a little bit younger, a little bit younger, a little bit younger, a little bit younger. And then the final panel, it's split between her child face and then her adult face to, to bring the reader back into the present. Which I, which I read as some kind of a deep psychic split that some kind of you know migrant condition, especially if somebody maybe forced well, to leave your home. Yeah, you because know. the thing is like you know if, if if we talk about the stages of migration, or at least the stage of migration, I think of, there is one really important stage. I think is like when you leave your home. In my case, my parents leaving and being forced to leave, right, yeah. um, for the sake of the future, and then spinning your entire decades afterwards, recreating your lives, rebuilding your lives in this new foreign place, there is also that, that stage of going back, right? Going back to your home and going back with this possibly preconceptions of what it's going to be like. It's not like the, this was after the Vietnam War, so it's not like they were having phone calls and like, you know, using Skype to talk to their parents. Like there's, so they only have this world that they left. And then they go back and see how radically different it is. And then suddenly, like, do you feel like an alien again then? Because now you return to a place where you going into it thought it was this home that you left, but now it's just completely foreign. And what does that do? So that, I, yeah, I, that that's reflected. I see that in her face, yeah. uh, if I may. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so your mother is the main narrator, but I, it kind of seems like the person who emerges from the pages as more of a central character would be your father. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, um, uh, I want to combine this with the discussion on the different techniques that you bring in to different styles that you use when you when you discuss, um, introduce or discuss uh, your family members. So here uh, you can see your father um, as a, as a, a youth, a youngster, all the way through his adolescent age, yeah. right? And um, here you're using a clear line um, style famously used by Hergé, of course, in his Tintin series. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell us why you chose this technique mm -hmm. for this specific stage in, in or for, for your father in the first place. Yeah. Well, it, for me, it was a, a no-brainer, honestly, because earlier in the story, there's an image of my father growing up, and he's gifted a a comic and it's Tintin. So to kind of plant the seed for this. And the reason is because that's the comic he read when he was growing up, Tintin and Astor Sinopolis. So those familiar, people are kind of familiar with those books? Okay. So and then I remember him having those books growing up growing up in South Carolina, like on the bookshelf. And I never looked at them because unlike my brother's comics, they were hardcover and they looked like real books. And I was like, I don't want to read real books. Because it was like spine, so I didn't see like the cartoon comic book, right? So, and it wasn't until years later, I'm like, I pulled it out, like, hey, this is a comic book. <laughs> uh, so it was important for me in this particular chapter where I, I, I share the story of him growing up as a child. So quite bluntly, the happiest time of his life in this story. Uh, it's contrasted with some other images 
that we may or may not see. Um, but, oh, oh, there you go. Uh, so, so the context, the setup for this story, and I don't think this is too big of a story, is it? Is it's, it's my father, learning about my father growing up, but from the framing story of him actually being imprisoned and tortured for several months. So the image over here is the, the present, right, when he's in prison and being terrible things done to him. Um, and then it switches very abruptly to his story growing up. So visually, thematically, emotionally, all very different. And I wanted to make that contrast as much as possible. It's a very powerful chapter. I mean, because especially if you think of, of um, Herugé as being somebody who, uh, you know, more recently has been has been uh, seen as somebody who, who has in post-colonial critique has looked at his work as being a little yeah. bit problematic. Yes. Um, and here you show, for example, in the, in the, in the Hergé side, uh, your father be acting in a film mm -hmm. by French colonialists. Um, that was quite a surprise. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> and, and he's acting, he's being uh, taken away and imprisoned, and on the other side you have him later being actually uh, imprisoned. So there's something about the naive, uh, you know, style of, of Hergé that comes out, especially in this contrast. Um, but I also wanted to, I mean, beyond yoking these two temporal moments on different sides of the page into one really fascinating uh, uh, page spread, if uh, what re what I find really fascinating is the the last panel on the page in a prison. Right. Um, where basically we get what's like a panel inside a panel inside of a panel. You know, when you're standing in front of two mirrors, and you can see en endlessly. It goes. Right. So I guess, so can I? Yeah. Uh, so this is the page. The, the structure of the page is the, it's three rows, right? So the first row is just this horizontal wide format. The next row are these three panels. And the bottom row are these two panels again, and then a panel here. But the panel here is this exact structure repeated on this scale. So three rows, wide panel, three panels, two panels. And the panel here, as you can imagine, this is the exact same structure repeated here, repeated again here. Three rows, one panel, three, three panels, two panels here, so on and so on. And, and there, yeah, I looked at it very carefully, and. Uh, some of the details are different, but the structure yeah. remains. Um, yeah. And I mean, the sense is one of, of you know both claustrophobia of you know the imprisonment, right, and also you know how time, you know, when you're staying in prison, I guess. Yeah, when you have no, well, there's not a clock, and, you know. There's the, you see light, daylight a little bit, and then you see daytime, and you see right. daylight. Like what? There's no, yeah. So this, this you, you use this technique again also with uh, your fa your father's friend Doug yeah. who's in a in a labor camp. Labor camp. Yeah, and that's exactly. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful, also. And I love, I like the fact that you pointed out that, that it deals also with the claustrophobia because there's also a scene before this chapter where I go and it's tough from my perspective. It's my first trip back to Vietnam in 2001. And we check into a hotel, and the hotel, I'm making a joke because there's like a typo in the hotel sign, or whatever. So the, the mood is kind of humorous, very lighthearted. Uh, but then my, my father has a very strange reaction because there's a very tiny window in the room. And, yeah, but the room is really high. nice. Yeah. And then he's just like, I refuse to say, there's no way we can say, he leaves, slams the door, and I'm just like, and he doesn't understand. And yet, like, we've well, already read this chapter. Mm -hmm. or, I think it's right before it's that. Right before. So it's just like for the reader and myself, which hopefully you're, you're in my shoes at that point. It's just like, well, that was weird. And then you read this, and then maybe it's not. I don't think it's heavy-handed, but there is a connection because then at the the end of this chapter, the way this chapter closes is a full page that's empty, negative space, and then it's just one small awesome. panel. As my dad. As if he's never ever, <coughs> that, you know, free himself from that space. I mean, yeah. that's what, what comes across. Um, we're moving into a different style. Um, and this oh, yeah. is, you can see the uh, communist uh, iconography or propaganda posters. Um, so, I mean, the colors are so vivid and uh, bright. And um, what? 
caused you to bring in the communist uh, uh, imagery into um, the <clears throat> So, another spoiler for anyone who hasn't read the book is one of the main threads is not just, oh yeah, perfect. Um, <laughs> uh, my father, it is my parents' story, but obviously it's a pa their story connected to their family. Mm -hmm. And my father's father, so my grandfather, abandoned his family, so his wife and his three kids at a very young age, because he was a patriot and he fought for the North. Uh, right? So against all the invaders that were coming in, wave, 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 wave after the invaders. So he abandoned his family to fight to basically help his country have independence. Mm -hmm. My father at the time, obviously, as a small five-year-old boy, is that something that you process? You're just like, wow, my, my father just left. Um, so <coughs> going back to, sorry, can we see the, so the, the comments thing is, mm -hmm. there are parts of the story where my father learns about his father's life after he abandons him. And a large part of the story is my father, I wouldn't say coming to peace, but having a little bit more empathy for what his father had to do and went through in the time that they're part. And so the communist posters like this one in the next page, uh, they're threaded in through when I'm like discussing my grandfather's story because, hey, he fought them for the communists. He was like, this is our country. He's, you know, but there's something also about the the way the bright, the bright uh, you know, future communist yeah. future is undercut also by the the lived reality. Right. Because and, and, and his his own yeah you know, uh, this experience is a, after the war was won. Right. Per, that's a really great point because yeah, it's bright, colorful, vibrant. It's so optimistic. You're you know you're fighting the good fight to free your country, and you finally win. It's all yours. And I guess this is just going to be a bunch of spoilers today. Uh, what I found out is that in his later years, although he was revered as this warrior, and he wasn't he was in combat, he was a, a doctor, so his job was to save people's lives. I, I don't know of any situation where he killed another human being or tried to kill another human being. Um, so he was revered as a wonderful war hero, um, but he was basically in self-exile. Uh, yeah. Because he was given this huge, beautiful property and home in uh, Ho Chi Minh City after his name, because that's where war heroes get decorated um, and all this stuff. But he was so uh, disillusioned with what the new corrupt government made the country that he was just self exiled and he never left the property. He never took visitors because people would not be like, pay their respect for what he did for the wars, all the wars. But he's like, no, I don't want to talk to anybody. Leave me alone. The only people who can visit me are my children. And even then, it was like his children from a new family. Right. Right. And so there's also some disappointment on his side that his first family, uh, you know, was not there. I don't know. But we're going to move on. Yeah. Uh, because we want to get to yeah. also what happens when they uh, arrive in America. So yeah. uh, let's let's. Um, uh, Look a little bit more specifically on migration and its consequences, and begin with this uh, evocative image, which is figurative and geographic, uh, um, you know, of a map. And you said it was one of your favorite slides. So, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, tell us about it. <laughs> um, I, I just really, I like that. to me, like, and this isn't just on a personal level. It's not one of my favorite slides. It's just from like a storytelling level. Like I enjoy contrast. I love. I think the, the first panel in this family portrait, um, which you can't read the type here, but uh, it occurs in other parts of the story, and then immediately juxtaposed with this diagram, which I do enjoy diagrams, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> no surprise there. Um, and, um, basically, so the, uh, for you guys, I know you can't read it, but the red symbolizes the Parents' Republic of Vietnam. The yellow is the Federation of Free States, which is three kids, right? Well, four, including me. I see. Me two and uh, in New York. Yeah, two of us in New York, one in California, one in Florida. Uh, essentially, a lot, th three out of four of us, as far as away as we can possibly be from our parents in the continental U.S. And then the brown is the great generational divide, and uh, the blue or the teal is the sea of cultural loss. 
So I, yeah, it's it's a I love this paint because it's just it has this traditional family setup with the portrait of like us all together. Uh, not the happiest expressions, but you learn why we look the way we look later in the book. Um, and then juxtaposed with this diagram, which is just it's an editorial like illustration to me, uh, because I, I I do write. I don't consider myself a writer. I consider myself a storyteller with visuals. So I, you're never you're never gonna get me to talk like at length about migration or write anything about migration. But if you want me to draw some diagrams or like the con pages, then I think that carries a lot more weight. Okay. So you mentioned also the, oh, yeah. okay, the photographs. Yeah. So uh, I, first of all, I have a question that I've been uh, wanting to ask you. Um, are these images actually drawn from real photographs? I mean, does an actual photograph of each of these two images here exist? Uh, an actual this? photograph of one does, yes. Which one? Uh, it's the, it's it's not in this context, but it would be that one where everybody looks sad. Because I go through the pictures and I see the ones like, why is everybody got sad face? Yeah. Like I go to my friend's house, yeah. I see the photos on the wall, smiling, laughing, it's like fun. My family's just like very serious, very serious. I'm like, okay, but yes, no, that is that actual. See that? I mean, that's the that is the clothing. We're not going to have time to talk about, but there are various photographs. Uh, photographic representations in the book, so I, I decided just to focus on these two, which are the beginning and the ending right. of the one but last chapter in the book. Right. And so this isn't a spread. This is this is an right. like early page. page, and this is a like the last page. Right. Which is why there's a big black space in between them, but I guess not big enough. <laughs> right. Um, so in the beginning, when you know when your family arrives and you're not yet part of it. Um, Right. And they begin the process of naturalization. You see, you know, everyone smiling and, and happy, and uh, and then we have the, the photograph that you used also with the uh, with the map of the generational divide, and your father's wearing his his shades, and uh, not only you and and your sister Bai look look happy. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Well, that's because we're, like, we're small children. We don't know anybody. You don't know any better, right? <laughs> that's the reason why my, my kid, my my father, when he's a kid, he's got a smile. So always a smile on his face. Why are the grown-ups not smiling? Oh, well, you have to read the book. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. needless to say, the the time in the States was not, was not easy. Was not easy, nor what they dreamed it would be. Right. And actually, so. it's interesting that you mentioned the word dream, because it says on the... Um, Oh yeah. And, you know, the clerk is saying, "So you got five years to enjoy the American, living the American That's dream." To right? process, get processed for naturalization. Right. Five, yeah. So, so the, you know, the, she mentions or she mentions the clerk mentions the American dream, and yet uh, the very image that you're presenting seems to, to you know, doesn't corroborate that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. would you say that the American dream was particularly? Inaccessible for Vietnamese refugees, or was it? So, so is it simply a more general illusion? I think it's a more general illusion because I can only speak towards my family and their experiences. And to be quite frank, like now, at this point in our lives, certainly not that point five years into it, mm -hmm. but now at this point, approximately forty-five years into it, um, things have turned out well for my parents. I mean, they're not like you know billionaires or anything like that, but they they're still retirement and that my, my mother is happy. <laughs> uh, my, my father, I know, is definitely happy because he's painting now. So to, me, to them, like, I, I don't know if that's what's, if they would define that as their American dream, but all four of their kids are alive, which if they say in Vietnam, uh, that not necessarily would not be the case. And, you know, all four of their kids are married, which to them is a, a part of the life process. And, they have grandchildren that they get to see, so I, 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 I would never ask them. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think uh, at that time, absolutely not. From the stories that I heard and the conversations that I had, uh, oh yeah, well, there you go, perfect. So, right. so I think this is going to be also the image, oh, maybe there might be one more, but uh, pretty much one of the, the last images we're going to look at, and uh, one of the most intriguing images in the book, and. Uh, you were mentioning, well, you know, what happened in between. I think you can, you, I mean, this image is packed full. We could talk the whole hour only about it. 
Um, but um, first of all, was Scrabble a game that you actually played? Yes. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, mainly with my grandmother, actually. Uh, a little bit with my sister. Scrabble was. Um, yeah, well, I mean, my father was a linguistics teacher in Vietnam, so he was very particular about speaking. Uh, so, uh, and then his his grandmother was also a very strict human being, to say the least. And all my memories of my grandmother are basically playing Scrabble. Like that's like what you know. And this 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 occurs. Sorry, to give context, this is a spread from a chapter, and the, the the story of the chapter is my grandmother's passing which is the, the only grandparent that I ever had any a relationship with, any conversation with, any real conversation with. So this chapter, that's why the Scrabble board is here, because it's, it talks about my grandmother and her passing. All the kids are, are reuniting to see my grandmother before she dies in the hospital. Um, but then it's also a chance for us to like reminisce a little bit and to learn a little bit more about our past. And, and also there's an undercurrent of basically like how my parents went through all this stuff to try to preserve the family, but this is a chapter where my mom finds out that, you know, despite all their best efforts, the kids are pretty estranged from each other. Like, you, you saw that map earlier, right? It's like, you know. And even though I lived in New York City with my sister Lisa, and even though we lived literally a 20 minute walk from each other's place, we would only see each other maybe at most once every two months. And it wasn't because we didn't like each other, it was just because we just, we had other things to do. <laughs> but, yeah. So, a few things. So it says in a culture, um, I mean, there's in a foreign culture of threatening our own, and then uh, the word home yeah. is like cast aside, and, and it's it, it, you can't assemble it. I mean, it, it's left unassembled. Um, and uh, so. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is what it is. I, I stand by it. <laughs> um, so, and also, I was wondering, with the, the words that you chose to write, a foreign culture threatening art, would this be more like your parents' sentiment, or as you as a child growing up, you know, as an American born, I mean, did you in any moment ever feel, you know, that the home was something fragile or tentative or, or... No, I did it because I was born here, right? I was born here, I was raised there, and uh, I had no recollection or experiences growing up in Vietnam. So even at least my brother had my memory, even though he was like six years old when he left, when I was talking to him, the research was fine, but he still had memory, he's talking about these things. So for me, that's strictly from the, the perception, the point of view of my parents, and but just my parents, not even my grandmother, because my grandmother was already... She, at this point in her life, before she passed away, she was pretty isolated. She didn't interact much with the family, so she created her own little bubble that she lived in. So the other, I mean, one of the many other interesting things about this panel are that the little vignettes that occur in between the, 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 word, the words, uh, which kind of maybe shed some light on some of the things that happened. So, so we see, for example, the generational divide, you know, when, when your siblings, or you, maybe that's you, uh, eating a McDonald's uh, no, uh, burger and, yeah. and your dad, you know, with the chopsticks. Um, mm -hmm. or, uh, or you see, uh, you know, the struggles when, when your yeah. mother goes to the Salvation mm -hmm. Army and, and, of course, chooses the wrong shirt for a, for a, a young boy. Yeah. Right? A Minnie Mouse. Instead of a Mickey Mouse shirt. A Minnie Mouse shirt. <laughs> Teased. And yep. you see how, how hard your parents are both working, you know, your mother's studying and working oh, yeah. and... Um, she was studying to get her business degree. Yeah. To, to get her? She was studying to get her business degree. Her business degree. While she's working two jobs, a waitress at Shoney's and I forget the other job. So these are some of the stress. So you can see these moments uh, uh, occur. Um, throughout, but this is one of the most vivid images. I think, yeah, we'll just end with this one. I think this is a, a, suited, a, a suited way uh, to end this, and right, it's time. Um, so here you are, uh, superimposed, I believe, yeah. upon your parents, but yet they're still kind of, you know, you're, you're transparent also. Yeah. Um, and, and you can see them also shining through you, yeah. so. Um, it's just a beautiful image. I think it, it really speaks for itself.
I, I, here's something I just noticed. I also forgot to draw a person image here. There's some blank space there. That's what happens when you see. I know. When, uh, yeah, when you're kissing, you're just seeing this big. I don't see the deep, the flaw is so large on the screen. So I really want to thank you for you know having this conversation with me about your work, and I hope you all found it enjoyable and. Thank you again.